Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Glad to see everybody out. Um, Mark is away this morning, and we're fortunate to have Ernest and Emily here today. And um, I want to go over the uh, prayer list. Remember the Gann and Massengill and Hayes family who have lost loved ones. And Othello <laughs> Corbett, who is in the nursing home. And of course, you know Chester is at home. And Eva Sue Coleman is in a life care nursing home. And Rosie Buckner, Leona's sister, is improving a little bit from her, um, uh, her um, baby potassium level. And um, we pray for Fanny Henson, who is at home. And Julia has COVID. And we're going to pray for Evelyn and Darlene Peel, who cannot be with us. Keisha's uncle Harper has cancer, and Keisha is still sick, and Harley Bowers has cancer. Sam Gooden, Joanne's great nephew, has cancer, and, and did get treatment, and it was a long, it was a long surgery, and I, I don't know the results of that yet. We're praying for Gus Buckner, Leona's cousin, who has cancer. We're praying for Drake Watson, Billy White's grandson. He has a severe heart condition. We're praying for Brenda Neal. She has cirrhosis and a large spleen, scheduled to have an upper GI at Park West on September the 13th. We're praying, praying for Rosie Gann. Of course, she lost her husband. But we're praying for her blood pressure and AFib issues. And she sees a doctor on September the 12th. We're praying now for my first cousin's wife, Carlene Brown, over in Lake Mendel, Tennessee, and she's she has bone uh, bone tra uh, trans cell transfer on I think Friday, and a friend of mine, Ron Swafford, he had some uh, toes amputated not too long ago, and he's feeling phantom pains from the loss of those toes. And we have some gospel meetings. One at Union Grove starts today, September 10th through the 13th in B.J. Clark, and it's 7 o'clock each night. And each side begins a gospel meeting September the 17th through the 20th, Matt Wallen, and it's 7 o'clock each night. And our service will turn it over to Cheryl in a few minutes, but we'll have an opening prayer. I'll do the opening prayer and the closing prayer will be Ralph Peel. Morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. Please get your songbook and turn to number 136.
turn to number 105. Let's sing this part. hard for us to understand that he would do this for us. But he did. He went to the cross on our behalf that he would forgive our sins. That we could have hope of salvation through this blood if we follow his commandments. Go with us as we take this fruit of the vine 
Lord's Supper, I'm going to read 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, beginning, well, verse 7. Every man, according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or a necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Shall we pray again? Father God, we come before your throne. Now, thanking you for all the material blessings that you've blessed us with. You blessed us with a nation that was founded upon your principles. You founded a nation that has followed your commandments, or followed your principles, and created the Constitution that we could live in a free world. We ask you to help us to remember that when we give, we give back the, a portion of the things that you bless us with. And, and we ask that we, did, we give that with the idea of, of helping others. And not for our glory, but for your son's sake, that we can spread your word in the Edelwall area and other areas. We ask you in, the, in the son, your son's precious name. Let's get your song book and turn to number 249. Let's sign it up before the lesson. Good morning, everyone. Morning. September the 10th, 1942, a day that will live in infamy. It's my birthday. Uh -oh. <laughs> 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 yes, 
guess what? That changed us. Landscape of Sand Mountain, Alabama. <laughs> but uh, it's been good. 81 years. Been praying around here. You act like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> sometimes you get away with it, sometimes you can't. Especially if I'm by myself, I can't, but my better has it with me. She keeps me straight. <laughs> you know, we live in a land of plenty. We live in a land of freedom. We can do about whatever we want. Either whether it's right or wrong, it don't seem to matter anymore in this country. People do whatever they please. Reminds me of the days of the judges. It said there was a time when there was no, when everybody did what was right in his own eyes, so to speak. But also, we are a very opinionated people. You know, you can discuss something, you know, and then you don't, depending on how many is in the crowd that you listen to, you don't get that many comments or differences or oppositions to it. But when it comes to our scriptures, the word of God that's been given to us, we don't have that, what do you say, privilege or leeway to question it or doubt it. A lot of people do. A lot of people don't like what it says, so they, they make it read the way they want to. The title of my lesson this morning is one that's called, I Know But. Did you ever have a Bible study with someone, you sit there talking, you read right out of the scriptures, and they say, yeah, I know what it says, but they don't know what it says. Without realizing it, they just express their lack of knowledge or ignorance of the scriptures. To read a scripture from the Bible, and if it contradicts what they believe, well, I know what it says, but. Romans 15, 4, Paul said, Whatsoever things are written before time were written for our admission and our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now he's talking about the things that are written before time, he's talking about the scriptures. In the Old Testament, we can go back and look at it and find all kinds of examples of what happens to people that says, I know but. You know, the very first one was in Genesis chapter 2. When Eve, when confronted by Satan and tempted to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she knew what God had told her because Satan reminded her of it. But she thought, well, I know what it says, but I'm going to eat up it anyway. What happened? They were driven out of the garden. Her punishment was laid upon her, her punishment was laid upon Adam. She knew what God had said, but she going to do something different. That should be enough right there to let us know that God means what he says. But then we read in Samuel where Saul was anointed king. God told him, you go down and you utterly destroy the Amalekites. Men, women, and children, and all the beasts and cattle. Don't leave anything alive but breathe. Saul went down there, whooped up on him. But he brought old King A.A. back. He brought the choice of cattle and oxen and stuff back. And on his way back to his home there, he was met by Samuel the prophet. Asked him, where have you been? He said, I've been doing the will of the Lord. Samuel asked him, did he burn you? It just, it kind of burns me. He's not talking to me, but when I hear that accusation that Samuel put on him, he said, what then is the lowing of the cattle and the bleeding of the sheep? Because if you've done what God told you to do, if you've been doing the will of God, they wouldn't be here even noise. They wouldn't be any there. They'd all be dead back there where you're supposed to kill them. And as a result, he was rejected from being king over Israel. That didn't mean that his reign ended right then. That means that there would be no more heirs of Saul to 
and sat on the throne in, in Israel. His descendants were not, his sons were not. He was rejected. He finally went mad, I suppose, is the best way to put it. He tried to kill David. He acted in a way that's totally irrational. Finally wound up taking his own life. And it was again, he knew what God had said, but he thought something different. Then there was Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron, the priests. They knew exactly how to offer sacrifices, being sons of Aaron, the priests. They'd been trained to death all their life. So he said they offered strange fire the sacrifice they did for a strange fire. We don't know exactly what that was. You know, a sacrifice was to be lit from the, with a fire from the altar, which burned continually. We don't know if they decided to use a big lighter or a black dot red diamond match or what. Or did they come up with this idea, well, Let's offer a sacrifice for this. I know God didn't say to do it, but he did say not to do it. So let's, let's offer this sacrifice, this particular, particular thing. Whatever it was, it's contrary to what God had told them to do. They knew better, but God set fire from heaven in the storm. Another one I know but really can grab you when you read this. It's talking about Uzzah. We know all we all know who Uzzah was. He's the man that went reached forth his hands to stay the ark when the oxen stumbled and the ark went to fall. And he touched it and God struck him dead because God had said, Do not touch the ark. Somebody said, well, he, he did not, he, that was just a uh, natural instinct. You know, I put myself there, probably done, would have done the same thing. Here's the ark of the Lord, this fixing to fall in these rocks in this creek. Mm -hmm. God said, don't touch it. But when you back up a little bit and see what the whole underlying problem was, when that ark was built, it had rings on the side. And they put staves through those rings and it's to be borne on the shoulders of men. Not on an ox cart. So they knew how to carry it. They knew what God had said and how to transport this ark. But they decided to put it on an ox cart. So that's where it all began. They knew but, and other, he knew not to touch it, but result is the same. He thought he was doing right by keeping the ark of God from hitting the ground. You know, if we look at Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus said, there, there are those that will say his name in the last day, Lord, Lord, and we not cast that name as your name and all that stuff. Jesus says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Not, he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall be saved, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And we have people today who claim to be doing the will of God, but they're adding this to it, they're taking this away from it. It is so plain when he tells us, he gives us all the instructions for how we are to worship. But some people have this idea because silence of the scriptures gives you authority to do anything you want to. <clears throat> I was engaged in a Bible study a couple years ago with a fellow in Cleveland. And I thought it was going good until it got down to the part about instrumental music. Instruments of music in the worship service. He could understand all the scriptures and everything that are read. Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 and all that. How we're saying to make melody in our hearts, how we're teaching it by from God. Yes, sir. But it doesn't say anywhere in the scriptures, thou shalt not have instruments of music in the worship. 
that was the thing, because it didn't specifically say that, then he thought it was all right. He ignored the fact that when God said, sing and make melody in your heart, so when he says sing, what does that do? That excludes everything else to sing. But people want to put their own ideas in it. They want to, but, but, you know, you can call this a, a motorboat trying to get everybody, but, 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 but. You're, I'm never, cease to be amazed at some of the reasons people can come up for not following the scriptures. Well, those were a people of a different type. They were savages, or they were this, or they were that. Today is different. No, it's not. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, didn't he? Nothing's been done today that hadn't already been done or thought of. When God decided to destroy, to destroy the world with the flood, he said no. Thought of man's mind was evil continually. That means they set up and not think of something bad to do the next day. And it costs them. Proverbs 14 23 says, There is a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Jeremiah 10 23 says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. You know, I don't care what we think of ourselves, how smart we think we are. Those two verses right there should put us in our place. We can't do it by ourselves. And people that want to shun the worship service and the assembling of the saints, the same goes for them in Hebrews 10, 25. He says, for if you sin willfully, and he's been talking about not forsaking the assembling of the church, Saints when they come together. <clears throat> and he says, knowing that you're supposed to come together on the first day of the week and soon. If you sin willfully, if you don't do that, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. That cleansing blood of Jesus stops when you commit the sin. Of course, we can repent of it and ask for forgiveness. <clears throat> we have to be consistent with God's word. People say, well, you're a legalist. On judgment day, there's going to be legalists there. And there's going to be liberals there, too. They're called sheep and they're called goats. On the judgment day, there's going to be them two groups out there, the legalist or the sheep, the one that follow God's word. Then it's going to be the goats over here, or the liberals. Well, I don't know what it says, but I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. When it comes to worship services and, and operation of the church, the elders have the charge. If it's something that is expedient, you know, if you're ready to do it this way, that's not a problem. But if it's something the scripture says, you do this, you do this, and they say, well, no, no that's a problem. we got to follow the scripture. Unity, what we got to have in the church in accordance with God's word. You know, Jesus prayed for his disciples in John chapter 16 and 17. And he said, <clears throat> at praise of the Father, on his behalf and on the apostles' behalf, he said, word that you have given me, I have given to them that they will give to faithful men after them that will follow, that will be, keep running down the line. That word that you give, the same word. John 12, 48 and 50, it says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges them. The same, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. That word that God gave Jesus, he gave to his disciples, his apostles. And they passed it on to other faithful men, preachers of today that keep preaching that same word and parting it to other people and to congregations. And it's got to be the same word. We can't water it down, we can't amend it. It has to be the truth. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, he said, 
that you need to be of the same mind and the same spirit. Talk to the brethren at Corinthians. So that, there's all kinds of little factors going on there in Corinth. And he said, you must be of the same mind, same spirit. Unity. Is there unity today in the church? <clears throat> Sad to say it's not. We have some buildings out here now that have Church of Christ on the door that's anything but. And then you got all the other three or 4,000 religious groups in the world that claim to be the church. When Jesus called for unity, that relieved it, I know, but. When he gave us the word, that, that done away with, I know, but. We got to stay with God's word. I don't have the smarts to change it. I heard a story one time of a lady who said, well, Mark 16, 15, 16 is not in my Bible. So I said, well, let me see it. They opened it up and sure enough, they wouldn't. There's just two holes in the page where she cut it out. Did that change it? In her mind, it did. We have got to do away with this I know but syndrome. And it's been around ever since the beginning of time. In uh, the New Testament, we've seen some people also who had that same mindset. We look at uh, the, the account in Acts 5, verses 1 through 11, Ananias and Sapphira. They were motivated by greed, really, to do what they did. They saw Barnabas sell some land he had and give the proceeds to help the poor. Well, they had, of course, they had money involved in their mind, and also they had, I think they wanted a little, little glory, a little self-recognition. They wanted to be named. Well, we did that too, you know. So they sell property, but they make it up between themselves. We'll keep some of it back, or we'll say, this is what we got for it, we did. And I know what Peter said to him. He said, you know, was it not yours to do what you wanted to with it? You didn't have to give it all. You just had to tell the truth about it. And they died, and they knew, but it cost them their life. When Paul was preaching in the temple in Jerusalem, the people came upset. Boy, they rushed up on him. He was about to kill him, so he was rescued from the mob, from the mob by the Roman soldiers. And he was taken before Felix. And Paul reasoned with him of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled at the word he had spoken. What does that mean? He knew what Paul had said. He understood it. He says, go thy way that for this time, when I have a more convenient season, I will call for thee. Felix had said in short, I know what you're saying, but I'm enjoying being governor more than I am want to be a Christian. James 2.19 tells us that the devils believe and tremble. What's the rest of that? But they don't have that obedient faith. They don't obey. So there, when somebody says, all you have to do is believe, this verse right here tells you there's more to it than just belief, though. If the devils believe in trouble, and they're still devils, they're still lost, well, what's the problem? They don't have that obedient faith. They don't obey. Matthew 26, 27, talking about Judas, one of the apostles. He had the I know attitude, but money was his vice. He knew that Jesus was the Son of God. He had been with the apostles, serving as their treasure. His decision to portray Jesus caused his dreadful demise. He knew who Jesus was. He knew what the plan was. He had heard it. He'd been with Jesus when he was teaching. He'd been with the other apostles. But money got in his eyes. He said, because of his actions and his denial, or his betrayal of Jesus, Jesus was arrested and crucified. <coughs> and when Judas had realized what he had done, he tried to return that money to the priest. They wouldn't have it. 
but it was blood money. They couldn't put it back in the treasury. So what they did, they purchased the first potter's feast. Buried human seed. With the blood money of Jesus Christ. Another New Testament example of a person who knew, but 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul talks of one of his co-workers named Demas. He had been an asset. He'd been worked through it real good. But he told Timothy, he said, Demas had forsaken him, having loved the present world more than God. He knew that he was right, but the world had a strong ruler to him. You know, he had to know to work with Paul. Well, you know, I, I, I struggled. I went to a school of biblical studies. I could tell you, it took me 20 years to complete the course. But I did. And stood, sat in class with some wonderful teachers and wonderful speakers. Brother and I admired right now. Good preachers and good teachers. But can you imagine what it would be like to be able to travel with Paul and hear him speak? See that the influence that man had on other people, especially those working with him, but yet it didn't take with Demas. I tell you what, the devil will not give up on you. So I said. Talking about a honky talk doing something, said, Boy, that's where we all be in there. So the devil's in there, said, Get him out. So no, the devil's not in there. He's already got you up here. He's out here on the street trying to get you. He doesn't give up. He looks for any chink, any crack in your armor where he can get in and cause doubt. I heard a story one time that said that the devil had called some of his chief workers in and was interviewing and asking how things were going. And one of them said, well, it's, it's kind of rough out there right now. So there's this thing going around that says God is dead, so nobody, it's no big deal. The other one said, well, the other one said, uh, I find it hard too. People just don't, uh, you can't pull away from anything. The other one, that's third one, he was having all kinds of success. He was getting all kinds of people. He said, what is it you're doing? He said, no big thing, but I just tell people to wait. Just wait, you got plenty of time. And there's people in this world today who know what to do, but they think they can wait till the last minute. That last minute may come totally unexpected. I visited with a fellow in the hospital one time who died up with cancer and he was on his final days. And I'll never forget, he stood there and, and I know we met the man a couple of times. And cried because he had he was a member of church but unfaithful had been in church a long time. But he had repented because he knew his end was near. But he says, I just hope the Lord can forgive me for all this all these years that I cheated him out of service. People talk about death, deathbed confessions and eleventh hour confessions and that kind of stuff. We serve a gracious and a loving God. And I'm sure it's just so, he said, and uh, John said, in 1 John chapter 1 9, if we are faithful and just to confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. So I'm not the judge. I know what the scriptures say. But somebody truly wants to serve the Lord and know what they should do, they should be doing it you know, for a lifetime. Not enjoy the sins and pleasures of the world up till they see the axe fix to fall and then jump up and want to repent. I'm not going to say that they can't, but just think about what they have cheated the Lord out of all those years in the service that they did. Luke 9, verse 62 says, Jesus said, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Acts 5, 17 through 29, Peter and the apostles were teaching and, and performing signs and wonders and healing the sick, the lame, and some that had unclean spirits. And the high priest rose up against them. 
and have him put in prison. The angel of the Lord come that night and released him from prison and told him to go back to the temple and continue speaking. What did Peter say? He, he, today he said, I can't go back down there. I said, they'll beat us to throw back in prison again. No, Peter went on down there. He went back. They did as the Lord had commanded. They were taken before the council again and were told that they have been commanded not to teach in God's name. Now this is a positive, I know but. <laughs> Peter could have said, I know what you said, but we ought to obey God rather than man. Now all the I know buts aren't bad, but that was a good one right there. He said, I know what you said, but we're going to obey God. Acts chapter 7, verse 54, when Stephen was preaching to the Jews and convicted of stolen the prophets and murdered Jesus, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They took him outside the city while they were stoning him. And verse 55 says, But he, that's Stephen, looked up steadfastly into the heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Because Stephen preached the truth, convicted the Jews of what they had done. It cost him his physical life, but he gained eternal life for his soul. That's what we want. We want that eternal life. <clears throat> One verse in, in the Old Testament that really stands out to me is Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You want to break that down and diagram it and see what it says? It says just what it says. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. People have the idea that you can't serve God and work on a job. Or you can't serve God and do any other thing. You go, I can't be a, a pilot, no, I can't do this. Other. Yes, you can. You can be an example on your job of what a Christian is. And that, is that not what we're supposed to do? Let our light shine before men, that all may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Oh, we just want to be. We want, we want the uh, we want the prize, but we don't want to do all that hard work to get it. But if we live our life and we serve Jesus Christ and keep His word, we're faithful unto death. We will receive that crown of life, Revelation two ten. I hope this morning I've said something that would cause you to realize that may, you may have some opinions or ideas, and that's okay as long as they don't contradict or go against God's Word. And when we have a Bible study with our denominational friends, one of their main questions that we well, ought to praise is, well, what do you think about so-and-so? What do you think about this verse? What do you think about so-and-so character in the Bible. It doesn't matter what I think. What does the Bible say? What I think won't get me there. i got to re rely on this book right here. If you're here this morning and you've relied on this book, that's great. A Christian. You've been immersed in the water and washed away your sins. Now live a faithful life and have that cleansing blood of Jesus keep you cleansed from your sins. And after having obeyed the gospel, if you, your faith has waned or you have done something that you shouldn't have, brought reproach upon the church, you can get repentance. You can repent of that and get forgiveness. Once again, we go back to 1 John chapter 1. Now, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins if we confess those sins. If you're not a member of the church, if you've never 
obey the Lord, obey the gospel. You very heard the word know that he, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel. He's the Son of God, come to this earth, lived and died on the cross, buried in the tomb, rose the third day, and has ascended back into heaven. And after becoming a Christian, <clears throat> you hear the word, you believe it, you repent of your, your sin, you confess his name before men, and as Jesus was buried in the tomb, you'd be buried in the tomb of water, under water and grave of baptism. Jesus rose to send him back to heaven, and you will arise a new person, all the sins forgiven, and walk faithfully with God till the end of time. You'll have that home in heaven. If you have a need this morning, whether for repent of sins or to obey the gospel, now is a good time. We ask you to come on your stand and sing. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus, Lord, tenderly upon your ear. Sweet in cry of love and pity calleth, turn and listen, say and do. Ye that labor and are heavy laden me upon. Remember, services tonight at 6 o'clock, Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, and again next Sunday morning, Bible study at 9 30, major services at 10 30. Please attend. Please bring somebody with you if you can. Let's find turn number 483. Turn number 483. Let's find this. First verse of this, and we'll have our closing prayer. Mm -hmm. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, be so sure of the cross. Live by his royal banner, it must not suffer. Yeah. 